Our next presenter, Cynthia Brazil, is robotics professor at MIT and creator of Kismet, and I am delighted that she's the second female presenter today. <laughs> Cynthia. Hi. Hi, uh, it's, it's certainly a pleasure uh, to be here today. I have to be honest and do some disclosure, which is I don't really think about the singularity uh, in my day-to-day -day research. Um, but I'm going to try to talk about my work and then at the end of the talk tie in how I see it can relate to the singularity if and, if and when it happens. Um, we've had a number of talks this morning um, uh, address the challenge of how do you create um, an intelligent machine? How do you create a machine um, that can think on its own, solve problems on its own? I'm going to be asking a different question, which is how can you build a machine that can coordinate its mental states and its behavioral states with those of others, and for my case in particular, humans, humans as we are today, um, in order to achieve shared goals. And uh, whether that shared goal is communication, whether it's teamwork and collaboration, where it's teaching or learning from one another. Um, I think for me personally, why, why I care about this question, um, you know, I grew up with Star Wars, and when I was 10, you know, I just was so captivated by R2-D2. And I think when you get right down to it, the reason why R2 was so compelling to me was not just because it was an incredible robot, that it had amazing abilities that complemented those of its humans um, and could get humans out of fixes, you know, that, that, that uh, they would find themselves in throughout the movie. But R2 had a great personality. R2's uh, cared about its people, its, its human compa uh, companions, and they cared about it. So it was a personal relationship that was deeply meaningful. And uh, I guess now that I'm all grown up but still have that child inside, I, I haven't given up on that, that dream of the robot sidekick. I want to try to create that, that kind of robot. So where, where are our uh, robot sidekicks? Well, you know, I think they're coming. And uh, we've been talking about robots, personal robots, for a long time, but I think finally we're starting to see the first distant cousins of those R2-D2 uh, robot sidekicks of the future. Um, I'm sure some of you uh, have a Roomba, so your vacuum cleaner is becoming, is already a robot. Um, with the success of the DARPA Urban Challenge, uh, many major car manufacturers see autonomous vehicles as the future of urban driving. And every year, of course, your car is becoming more and more like a robot. You have major automotive manufacturers like Honda and Toyota creating humanoid elder care robots with the philosophy of when you're young, you'll probably buy a car because that's what you're going to need to live your life. But when you're old, you might buy a robot because that's what's going to help you live independently longer. And of course, you know, there was an article a few years ago by Bill Gates uh, on Scientific American saying that, yes, personal robots are coming, uh, articulating many of the parallels of the 1970s personal computer market to the personal robot industry of today. And I think, you know, if Bill Gates says it's happening, it must be true, right? So uh, <laughs> they're coming. So when you think about personal robots, when you think about robots really for anyone and everyone, this is really posing fundamentally different new questions to the field of robotics. Because you can imagine, traditionally, robotics has been about interacting with things. Interacting, being skillful in your interactions with the inanimate world. So whether you think about car manufacturing robots, or robots like Sojourner Pathfinder, an, an experimental probe where people control it to be able to do science at a distance, or more sophisticated dexterous robots. I mean, this has always been about building robots that are capable of interacting with things that are governed by the laws of physics. Um, but I think when you talk about personal robots, there's a new set of questions in that robotics, these personal robots of the kind I'm talking about, is going to be about interacting with people in order to do things. And you know, you can imagine that those kinds of robots might be robots for highly trained specialists, such as here. Uh, this is Robonaut at NASA Ames, uh, designed to be able to use the same tools and work with the same sort of uh, 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 materials as a human astronaut to be able to so serve joint tasks together. But of course, the, the topic that I'm particularly interested in is, is what about this one over here, which is the robot in the home of the everyday person. And I'm particularly amused by this, this picture from Honda in that their vision of the robot is, you know, certainly one is of a family member, because it's sitting here in the family photo, but there's a particular status, because you'll notice poor Rover here has been kicked to the curb. <laughs> so, so our visions of these partner robots and, and how we'll, 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 we'll view them in our, our families and our homes is, is certainly an intriguing question. Um, so, but of course, then the question is also, well, how are we really going to interact with them? Because most robots today are for specialists. They're specially trained in order to interact with these robots. How are we going to have everyone be able to interact with these robots? And of course, I think one thing we have to appreciate is how profoundly 
social people are, and people like Cliff Nass, who's an expert in human-computer interaction, talks about the social interface, as, uh, the universal interface. So we know that human social intelligence is a really fundamental way we have of thinking and relating to the world, and in particular, the way we have of understanding other entities whose behavior is governed by having a mind. And I think this is where we need to get need to get with robots in terms of social intelligence is how can you build robots that are capable of interactions with entities whose behavior is governed by having a mind. So that's really what I mean by social intelligence. And I think uh, this, 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 this within humans, it's, it's, it's a very deep form of understanding that, that goes to our subconscious level. So in 1944, Heider and Simmel showed that when people are seeing sh even just simple abstract moving shapes on a screen, we don't describe the scene in terms of spatial relations and accelerations and decelerations, people ascribe intentional states to these shapes if they move in a particular way, things like aggression, escape, fear, and so forth. And of course, because these processes are so deep-rooted in what it is to be human right now, it's not surprising that we put robots like, like Ruma that were never designed to be social, but they push on those same kind of social buttons. And of course you see behavior like this, people anthropomorphize them uh, out the wazoo. So, you know, and Roomba doesn't have any understanding of you as any different than a chair or a piece of furniture to be navigated around. So I think the challenge then is, you know, people are clearly willing to meet these robots more than halfway, I think. The challenge is how do you start to build machines that can hold up their end of the interaction. Um, and that's really what I'm going to try to focus on today and, and illustrate that with a, a few examples from my lab. So this is the robot Kismet. I don't know how many are familiar with Kismet, um, but this was uh, the first social robot that was really designed explicitly to ask this question about interpersonal interaction between humans and machines. And it was uh, completed in roughly 2000. So this is a, it's a very new field. It's a very, very new field. So the thing I want to talk about today is how do you build robots that can actively relate to people, not only in terms of behavioral states, but in, in psychological terms. So how do you build, in, in some sense, robots that have a theory of other minds, that can understand our behavior in terms of our internal intents, beliefs, desires, and so forth? Because it's clear that people are ascribing and trying to understand these robust behaviors in these same psychological terms. And the approach that I'm taking, you know, it's different than a lot of previous approaches that have focused more on sort of abstract symbol manipulation. And then I'm fundamentally trying to la leverage the uh, embodiment of the robot to, to, in essence, experientially ground this sort of understanding um, so that the robot essentially is, is, is taking a like-me hypothesis, is trying to essentially uh, imagine what it would be doing if it were in your shoes, so to speak, the sort of perspective-taking approach um, in order to be able to understand us, help us, and learn from us. So I'm going to... Um, highlight some of these examples. A, a lot of the, the approach that I've taken has been deeply inspired and informed by developmental psychology. So we know as humans we're incredibly socially sophisticated. It takes many, many years for us to develop this social competence and we know that social interaction is critical for us to do this. Um, and remember the, the, the projects I'm going to highlight for you um, is very much inspired by developmental psychology and a lot of neuroscience is arguing that this embodied approach is, is much of how we, as people, acquire the social ability, social intelligence ability. So um, this is the key sort of strategy then. Um, being in a body with a mind, in a world with bodies with like minds, yields a number of multimodal associations between the self and the appearance of other agents, between the behaviors of, of self and the behaviors of other agents, as well as ultimately internal workings of the mental states, where the solid arrows uh, denotate uh, the observables and the dash arrows uh, denotate what can be inferred through the behavior. So we're going to basically try to apply this strategy in a number of different contexts to, to bootstrap um, social intelligence of robots in, in a number of dimensions. Now, um, I'm going to be going through three quick examples. Uh, I have to say, you know, when you're at a, a, a forum like this where people are talking about the future and where things are going, and then you know you think about where robots are today and, and the state of the art. You know, state of the art seems kind of arcane, <laughs> ironically, I guess. But um, I want to show you uh, three examples that kind of highlight this approach um, of building these robots that are trying to basically acquire this ability to understand people in psychological terms. So the first example I want to talk about um, is imitation, 
We know from uh, human infants, imitation undergoes a very rich and interesting developmental profile, but it begins with early facial imitation. And this is one of the models proposed by Andrew Meltzoff and Amor uh, called the AIM model. And the basic premise is that, you know, how do infants potentially minutes after birth, how are they able to imitate the observed facial expressions of others? Because when you observe a facial expression, that's in the visual modality, but if you're, you're going to produce that expression, that's in a motor modality. And you, as a newborn infant, you haven't seen yourself in the mirror. So how do you do this sort of cross-representational uh, transformation in order to do facial imitation? And he, he came up with a very, this, this, this model where the argument is the way that we can, the way infants bootstrap this ability is basically through playing this sort of imitation game with the caregivers where he's found that of course human parents are prolific imitators of their infants. So the idea is infants come into the world, they have a set of, mo mo they have a motor repertoire, and they're capable of going through this sort of motor babbling routine. Um, they also have an innate sort of understanding of how gross regions of the face mapped to uh, regions of another's face. So they don't not know the subtleties of how you move, but it might know that brows map to brows and mouth brow maps to mouth. And then through this imitation game, basically the argument is, it's gonna be learning this sort of intermodal representation of transferring from the visual domain to the motor domain. If you can re-represent the stimulus in terms of the motor representation, now it can do a sort of search to match process in order to imitate it. So I'm going to show a video here of what this process looks like um, for training just the mouth region uh, of a virtual robot, Leonardo. At the time we did this work, the physical robot didn't have the skin on its face. So we did it through simulation so people could see the facial expressions. But this is, again, very much inspired by uh, the process that infants go through, where first Leo's just babbling the way that an infant might, might babble, so to speak, and the human is imitating that. And as they're doing, we have an iMatic system that's tracking the, the motions of the, the mouth region. Leo has a sense of contingency, so he only bothers, in some sense, capturing or relating the regions of the mouth that respond contingently uh, to its own movements. And I think contingency is one of the key things that, that makes this work. So now, basically what the robot's doing is taking those training instances that it gathered through this imitation game in order to train an intermodal representation, which is actually this, this, this center part here, going from the visual stimulus to re-representing it in terms of the motor coordinates um, that it uses to generate its own facial expression. Once it can learn this representation, then basically the imitation is a search over this sort of blend space of its, of its uh, motor repertoire in order to produce the, uh, the outcome. So if you do that for the various regions in the face, then you can see imitation of, of, of whole facial expressions and even novel facial expressions that the robot hadn't explicitly seen before. In this case, the cock brow is one example of that. And then we've been able to show that it can also generalize to other people um, with other facial features so forth. So, so I'm gonna just go on to the next slide here. So um, from this imitation example, you can imagine the kinds of things that a robot might learn would be things such as body maps. How do I map my body as a robot onto the body of other human, uh, humans in the environment? The intermodal representation in many ways is a sort of mirror system that can relate visual observations to motor representation. So it's a sort of dual use of using the same motor knowledge in order to recognize activity in others. And of course, there's the ability to mimic. So, this is a precursor to a lot of other skills. So what's another skill that infants exhibit? Now we're talking about one year of age versus say right after being born. And I think one classic example is social referencing. This is something that we of course do well into adulthood and you're all familiar with it. But in the case of a very young infant, this is a, the visual cliff study, which basically is when infants are about 12 months of age, they sort of peak in this ability that if they're encountering a novel situation that they don't know what to make of it, they look to their mother's face, they look to a trusted individual's face, and look at her emotional reaction. And they adopt her reaction to appraise the current situation for themselves. So in the case of a visual cliff, if the mother looks fearful, the infant won't go over the glass in order to approach her, but if she looks encouraging and yeah, it's okay, then the infant is much more inclined to actually traverse um, the glass in order to approach her. So, in order to implement this ability uh, with on a robot, you can imagine going through the same sort of developmental uh, process where you leverage the ability to imitate. So in this case, this is just basically reformatting or re rephrasing. The previous demonstration was that if you can observe a thought, smile, you do the intermodal representation, you do the search to match, and then you can produce a smile. So this is just mimicry. Now, we also know from psychology that when you talk about emotion um, and motor responses, there's a dual loop. So it's not only that if you experience emotional reaction, you exhibit an expressive response. If you're happy, you smile and so forth. But it also turns out that just by putting your face in a configuration, 
people have found, or scientists have found, that you can induce that effective state. So there's kind of this reverse process as well. So you can model that within the robot. So if the robot exhibits a smile just due to mimicry, you can cause this inner loop to happen where now the ro robot induces this positive effect that goes along with that expression. In some sense, bringing us up a sort of empathetic understanding of your, of your uh, expression. And then, if you do that often enough, you can learn a direct mapping then of just visual response to understand the effective intent. But understanding it not in terms of symbolic, but in ter understanding in terms of internalizing the positive effect within the robot. So this is going to be a, a video of, of social referencing where um, some people are very upset that we, we do this with the Cookie Monster. But um, Cookie Monster is Leo, this is stimulus. Cookie Monster. This first part is just showing that he, he sees Cookie can Monster. Can you find Cookie Monster? He's aware of it. He can point to it. And he knows his name, Cookie Leo, Monster. Leo, Cookie is Monster is very bad. Okay, now we're going to do the social referencing. Oh, very Cookie bad, Monster. Leo. Bad, bad, bad. And Leo's picking up Cookie on Monster that. Is he's very, picking up very on bad. it because of the furring of the brow. He's also paying attention to the tone of voice. You can see he's starting to. to, to he's to, a scary <laughs> monster. He he's wants to get, get your, your cookies. cookies. All right. <laughs> And finally, he goes, okay, none of that. Get that out of here. Get that out of here. All right. Uh, it's okay, Leo. All right. Now we're going to okay show now. Big Bird. Now, Big Bird was previously associated with the positive things. We did the same thing, but Big Bird's a good thing. So this is showing the, the, the memory, essentially. So he sees Big Bird. I like it. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Get the good. Get the good. Get the good. And then you can bring back Cookie Monster. And he's like, mmm, none of that. None of that. Take that away. So, so I mean, this is intriguing because what we're doing here is we're basically teaching the robot um, some prim primitive sense, maybe you know, appraisals or, or values of things. So you can imagine what we might want to teach robots in the future is not just how to do tasks and skills, but but how to assess events and things in the world that are commensurate with, with how we value them. Um, so the final demonstration I want to talk about is now getting more into uh, the cognitive domain where you know social everything is about sort of effect and emotion. This is really about trying to infer intents and beliefs of others. And again, we're using the same strategy, which is simulation theory, where the idea is the robot essentially makes this implicit like me assumption that people are like it. Therefore, it can use itself, its same mechanisms that it uses to generate its behavior in order to essentially step into your shoes, imagine what it would be like to be you in order to infer what your internal states might be. And it turns out there's a lot of exciting work going on in social uh, cognition and neuroscience showing that if you take fMRIs of the brain and have people do tasks like read a story and imagine taking their own perspective versus the perspective of another, that again, there's a sort of dual use. There's a lot of reuse of the same regions in the brain to have your own, appreciate your own perspective, to, to having yourself be able to also appreciate this perspective of another. So I'm going to show um, a third video here. In this here video, the robot Leonardo demonstrates his ability the robot to recognize Leonardo the intentions is applying of the these human abilities partners, into a even collaborative when their situation. actions are based on incorrect information. And this is inspired by these classic in his false belief psychological tests his sensors. that At psychologists time, used to assess a child's developing uh, false belief in theory of mind. Human partners. Here, everyone watches as Jesse places cookies in the box on the right and chips in the box on the left. So there's a Vicon Since system people are present, that the robot's using the map head position, the hand position, Leo's motion of the boxes and the motion of the cookies based on ideas from and the chips. Known as so this is the theory. cognitive architecture we've been developing. Core mechanisms of behavior the two bands basically represent the same processes that are used to generate the robot's in behavior also used in Leo order to simulate the behavior of others. Okay, this you can same the data again. is presented to duplicate systems, which represent the unique visual perspectives of its human partners. Now, as Matt leaves the room, Jesse decides to play a trick on him, and switches the locations so of the snacks. So Leo has to keep track of the beliefs of both Maddie and Jesse. And Leo knows that Maddie's Since Matt loved. is absent, Leo only updates his model of Jesse's So Jesse has true beliefs, and Leo has to keep track of that. But he has to also infer now that Maddie has false beliefs because he didn't actually observe the switch. And the task then is Leo has this little control box that he's going to use to open one of these two boxes to help you get your desired food item because he's going to be a, a helpful collaborative robot. Now Jesse seals the boxes with combination locks, preventing easy access to the snacks. When Matt returns, 
hungry for a bag of chips. He tries to guess the combination to the box where he remembers seeing the chips. As Leo watches Matt reaching for the lock, he tries to infer Matt's intention by searching for an activity model that matches the observed motion and task context. Once a matching activity is found, Leo uses his model of Matt's beliefs to predict what Matt's goal might be. So Leo knows that then Matt's beliefs Leo are uses false. his own model of the true state of the world and he can to infer that Matt's to plan to get his desired food item is invalid. So even though Matt's doing the completely wrong Having action on the wrong Matt's thing, Leo is actually able to understand Leo what his true goal is by opening a box in order to help to Maddie get panel, providing his Matt desired food the item. He desires. He's moving a little slowly. <laughs> He's going to flip this switch, and there's the chips. That's what Maddie wanted. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> All right. And then Jesse comes back. Jesse now has Jesse returns the situation. and tries to open the same box. Leo correctly infers that Jesse wants the cookies since Jesse is aware of the actual contents of the boxes. Matt and Jesse both perform the same physical action, but Leo's ability to model their individual beliefs allows him to correctly assist them in achieving their different goals. Okay, yay, all right. So uh, this is my chance to wrap up now. Um, I just want to kind of summarize and, and kind of connect this now to the, the singularity if and when it comes to So why is this relevant in the context of the singularity? Well, I think certainly from the media standpoint, the biggest concern is how do we avoid the Terminator? How do we avoid the Terminator? We want to make sure that these robots, if they become super intelligent, are going to be our allies and not our adversaries. And perhaps this line of research is a way of posing these questions in a way that if we can build these robots in a way that they can understand us, relate to us, perhaps even empathize with us, maybe that's a way to, to address that challenge. I think the other big question that this uh, work raises uh, is, you know, if we hit the singularity and we become uh, cyber humans and, and, and immortal, so to speak, just appreciating that there's a lot more to human experience that makes life worth living besides the ability to be super smart and solve problems. And this is trying to reach on this more sort of human dimension of relationship, because certainly within our humanity now, relationships are a very important part of what makes life worth living. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what kinds of experiences, a quality of human experience, do we need that is going to make it make immortality worth enduring? Um, and I think that's something that we have to also ask ourselves. And then finally, um, you know, I think we build these things for a lot of reasons. I think one of the reasons why we build them is, first of all, it's just a creative endeavor, and as humans, we're, we're profoundly creative. But I think also it's a way for us to try to understand ourselves. These robots become a mirror. Um, with which we can look upon our own humanity. What does it mean to be human? What kind of humans do we want it to become? And, and, and posing new questions. And I think this era of the relational robot is in some ways asking a new question and continuing that dialogue from, you know, can a machine think and what is the nature of intelligence to more recently, you know, can a machine have emotions and what are emotions and even trying to come to a deeper understanding of what emotions are within people. But I think the core question, the central question that this work is starting to touch is, when is a machine a person? And for us uh, as humans, when would we be granted, uh, willing to grant the status of personhood to something that's not biologically human? And I think that's particularly important for Singularity since at some point that, that may be us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia.